You know what happened in the New Orleans Saints win on Monday night against the Jacksonville Jaguars, but let's talk about how it all happened with our film review and analytics breakdown for today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On today's episode, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our film study notes. Got to take a look at the All-22 for both quarterbacks, and we'll also take a look at Marquez Calloway's big day as well. What is it that makes him so special, and how does he just get so open? We'll talk about that and take a look over on the defensive side as well, particularly at the cornerback position, who stood out and who could step up with Ken Crawley out for a couple of weeks. We've got all that on today's episode. And as always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, co-managing editor over at CanalStreetChronicles.com, and your Tuesday co-host over in the National Locked On NFL podcast. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked On Saints, your team every day. And don't forget that today's episode is brought to you by our good friends over at rockauto.com. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and don't forget to let them know that Locked On sent you. Now, let's go ahead and get started with today's episode here. We're going to start off taking a look at the quarterbacks as well as the offensive line in this one. So I went over the coaches film, the all 22, whatever it is that you want to call it. Went ahead and broke it down and uh, saw a lot of great things from Jameis Winston, saw some nice things from Taysom Hill, saw some not so great things from Taysom Hill, but saw a lot of good stuff from the first team offensive line. But let's start with the quarterbacks here. We know that that is what you want to hear about. Jameis Winston did a great job, again, progressing through all of his field reads, using the whole field, getting from read one to three on a few different throws. Uh, The check down to Tony Jones Jr., his only incomplete pass of the game that looked like to be about his third or fourth read there and unfortunately just missed on that pass. But the two big plays, let's talk about the touchdowns. We'll start off with the first one to uh, Marquez Calloway. Well, they were both to Marquez Calloway. We're going to talk about Marquez Calloway's day here in a little bit, but let's focus on the quarterback for a moment. Uh, In this one, you saw a cover three look. You saw the safety over the middle and then two deep defensive backs over on either side as well. And the thing that was so impressive about this is that basically this play was designed not to go to Marquez Calloway, who's running the fly route up the left sideline, but it was actually designed for Deontay Harris, who was running the deep out route toward the left sideline. So basically, the idea was that Marquez Calloway was a clear out to get both of those, the DB that was on him, as well as the safety over the middle to follow him up the seam and up to into the end zone, leaving Deontay Harris one-on-one to get to the outside and be able to beat his man toward the sideline. So that was the plan. But because that middle safety that's over the middle of the field there, remember this is cover three, so you have a safety right in the middle of the field, ends up crashing down. That's what led Jameis Winston to throw the pass. And the thing that was so impressive about this, this play was that on Jameis Winston's side, that defensive back, the safety over the middle that crashed down on Deontay Harris, the reason that Jameis Winston took the decision or made the decision to go over the top instead of to the out route took three steps and the ball was already out of Jameis Winston's hand. He saw the momentum of the defensive back, the safety making the decision to crash down on the out route and then immediately launch it to Marquez Calloway on the other touchdown, the second touchdown to Marquez Calloway down the left sideline. It was on a third down play, a couple of run plays before that, a couple of short passes before that. Jaguars clearly no safety deep on the play pre-snap. So that first one is a post-snap read. Snap the ball, saw what the safety did, made a decision based off of that. This one is a pre-snap read to where he sees no safety. He ends up basically pointing over to Marquez Calloway, and then he kind of gives him a little uh, hand wave or, or a little symbol, a little hand symbol down near his waist, effectively letting Marquez Calloway know, just go and I'm going to put it up for you. And so he snaps the ball, takes three steps back, and then ends up hitting uh, Marquez Calloway in it with a, a, a nicely placed pass. It really was. I mean, it was over the shoulder, gave him the opportunities where he was the only, Marquez Calloway was the only player that could make a play on it. But we have to give Marquez Calloway a lot of credit there too, in the corner there at the goal line and, and as well as the, the pylon, 
making the one-handed catch over his shoulder. I mean, just an incredible play by Marquez Callaway, but a very nice throw from Jameis Winston as well. And Taysom Hill was not without his impressive moments as well. He had a very, very nice, couple of very nice throws actually to uh, Lil Jordan Humphrey on a couple of separate drives, not all on the same drive. He had six drives in this one while Jameis had his three to open up the game. Uh, He put one basically on the outside of Lil Jordan Humphrey, allowing Lil Jordan Humphrey to kind of catch. And then it, it, it created separation. The ball placement created separation. So he had the ability to create some yards after catch. And there was another pass that Taysom Hill threw on the move that he put right over the top of a defender. He had one defender to the left sideline of Lil Jordan Humphrey. Then Lil Jordan Humphrey also had another defender just sort of below him downfield of him. And uh, Taysom Hill with really nice placement to just bloop, drop that right in where it needed. And then again, gave Lil Jordan Humphrey the opportunity to create after the catch. We're going to talk a little bit more about Lil Jordan Humphrey because there's a bit of an underrated piece of his game that was just really out there for everyone to see against Jacksonville and not enough folks are talking about it. So we're going to talk about it, but that'll come up next. But I do want to shout out the offensive line here because we also had these. Oh, and I want to talk about the touchdown Taysom Hill threw too. Whoops. Sorry about that. Almost missed that fade route. Really simple, nice little play. You saw him give a hand symbol to little Jordan Humphrey as well. Good communication there. Ended up putting the ball over the top. The issue with Taysom Hill ended up being... um just missing on a couple of plays. And I don't necessarily mean missing in terms of off-target throws, which we did see a couple of those, but also just opportunities to, you know, get a pass over the middle to, you know, a a crossing Ty Montgomery who was coming from right to left. And then on that same play, you saw the mesh concept, a a kind of a drag route coming toward the, uh, closer to the line of scrimmage, I believe it was Juwan Johnson, who was also open, you know, and, and he could have hit him, but he ended up taking a sack instead. On the play that he got called for intentional grounding, there was an earlier route that he could have gotten to, but stepped up into pressure. Uh, So it was just those things to where you can see the difference between Jameis Winston's decisiveness, decision making, and saying, I'm throwing this pass and I trust that I'm going to be able to complete it. That big touchdown to Marquez Callaway, for instance, as well as a couple of other plays to Marquez Callaway. And then you see sort of the lack of self trust in Taysom Hill is, is what it looked like, right? I mean, I don't know what's in the guy's head, obviously, but would look like a lack of self-trust in terms of his ability to make some of these throws. And so he would double clutch, step up into pressure, things like that. And that caused him a lot of the trouble that you saw him get into on Monday night. But you also saw some good things for him from him. I think you just saw more consistent good things from Jameis Winston. Obviously, he completed nine of his 10 passes. I mean, he had a very, very good night, 157.7 passer rating, if I remember correctly, for that day as well. So an incredible day. But I do want to quickly shout out before we move on to the wide receivers, the offensive line, particularly uh, the first unit offensive line. That second unit offensive line looked like it struggled quite a bit, didn't give Taysom a ton of time. And I know that that causes a lot of sort of animosity around the, the offensive line. But remember, what you're looking at when it comes to that second team are individual players that would be playing in concert with four other first string starters or a six offensive lineman that we'd be playing with the five other starters. You're not talking about having to replace your entire offensive line at the same time. Now, uh, I will mention uh, Ryan Ramchick, who had an incredible block. If you watch it, the first touchdown pass to Malcolm, excuse me, to Marquez Calloway, you saw the uh, play action to the running back on that one. And then in order for that play action to work, the offensive line has to sell it as well. The Saints are a zone run team. So you see them take what's called a read step first, where the play is going, right? Quote unquote going. And then Ryan Ramchick getting in and cutting off and in some interior pressure there and getting his hands in perfect placement. So he couldn't get called for a flag, didn't go over or across the body of the defender, stayed on the same side of the defender and kept his positioning between the defender and himself instead of trying to wrap around and then give that defender the opportunity to cut back inside, which would have blown the entire play up. So Ryan Ramchick really helping to make that first touchdown happen. And that offensive line for the New Orleans Saints looks fantastic going into 2021. Now, coming up next, we talked about the quarterbacks, talked about the offensive line. Now, let's talk about these receivers who made some incredible plays. What is it that makes Marquez Callaway so special? Why aren't we talking enough about this specific element when it comes to Lord Jordan Humphrey? We're going to answer those questions as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. All right, family, continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Want to talk about these wide receivers for the New Orleans Saints because let me just tell you this Marquez Callaway is something special. Little Jordan Humphrey is better after the catch than you think he is. That's, that's it. Like, those are the takeaways that I really pulled from watching the film in this one. 
Marquez Callaway can be a number one receiver. Remember, there's 17 games this year. That means you have to average 58 yards per game to be a thousand yard receiver. And he might do it. Like if he can stay healthy, this guy might do it because not only is he somebody that can be trusted over the middle of the field to pick you up some chunk yardage in terms of the 15, the intermediate, you know, 15 to 20 yard area. He's also has this deep ball potential that you don't expect from a guy, his size and his speed. And we were talking about four five speed here. We're not talking about four, 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 three, burn the house down speed, but because he is such a technical route runner, he wins from the line of scrimmage understands how to get over the top of a defender, create natural separation based upon his positioning and body positioning, and he will fight for the ball, fighting through contact. The big touchdown catch, the first one clearly interfered with, just run into by one of those Jags defenders and still came up with that catch. Marquez Callaway is such an incredible story right now, right? Undrafted free agent coming into the NFL, landing with the New Orleans Saints, after going undrafted because his draft stock was tanked by bad quarterback play and bad play calling and bad coaching, still averaged 21.2 yards per catch during that bad quarterback play and bad play calling and bad coaching, came into the NFL, lands with the New Orleans Saints, and now Ocho Cinco sending him text messages asking him for a signed jersey. Mina Kimes is talking about him on ESPN. NFL.com is calling him the potential or asking out loud like, Look at this guy. Could he be breakout player of the year? The answer NFL.com is yes. This dude has everything that he needs in front of him. I'm talking about talent. I'm talking about opportunity. And now I'm talking about the intent in the offense. There's no other receivers in front of him on this roster right now. None. And no one's going to get in front of him on this roster right now, except for when Michael Thomas comes back. And that's a pretty good wide receiver tandem to have (laughs) Michael Thomas and Marquez Callaway. But then you look at the intent of the offense. If Jameis Winston is indeed going to be the starting quarterback, as we all expect at this point, the intent of the offense is to take shots down field. When you're at the 50 or just beyond the 50, you're in between that 35 to 50 yard line going into enemy or going, yeah, going into enemy territory and threatening, then all of a sudden, you're taking shots at the end zone in this New Orleans Saints offense again. You're not continuing to matriculate the ball down the field. No, 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 no. You're taking the top off. You're going for it, right? And that's exactly what you saw with the first one. It was a second down, nice, safe play. You got a nice uh, chunk of a couple of yardage, a couple of yards off of the run play on first and 10. Now you're in a nice little position here to take a shot on third down and still have, a, excuse me, a second down and still have a manageable third down to pick up the first. Didn't need it. And so all three of those things come together, that triumvirate, comes together for Marquez Calloway, and now here he is hinging on star status in 2021 as a diamond in the rough. And speaking of diamond in the rough, Lil Jordan Humphrey is somebody that we've seen a lot of ups and downs and inconsistencies from, particularly as somebody that's fighting for passes. However, on that touchdown that Taysom Hill threw, that was a fade route to him at the front of the end zone. He went up and got it. So he was a big man doing big man things, and that's what you want to see from Lil Jordan Humphrey. But that's not the most exciting part of his game. The most exciting part of his game is his ability to break away after the catch. His yards after catch ability at his size, and let me remind you, six foot four, 220 some odd pounds. This guy is not usually the wide receiver that you talk about being a yards after catch threat. That just ain't what it usually is, right? But now you're, but you saw that from him. You saw that from him with Taysom. You saw that from him with uh, Jameis in the first game as well. You saw, I, I saw that from him during training camp. While I was at camp and I watched him have a big, long catch and run, he scored the first touchdown that we saw during that week of camp on a catch and run. His ability to break tackles, to spin out of tackles, like he just does things that you don't expect to see somebody of his frame do. And so I think that tandem right there, assuming that Traquan Smith is not going to be healthy to start the season, where you have Marquez Calloway, Lil Jordan Humphrey, Potentially Deontay Harris at the beginning of the season. Let me remind you just one more time in case you haven't heard when it comes down to Deontay Harris's suspension. We don't know how long that could take. We know that he got arrested for a DUI in July, but that doesn't mean that he's going to get suspended before the beginning of the season because when you look at the DWI that uh, PJ Williams, and in some states, those are the same thing, but PJ Williams got in January of 2019, he didn't even have the opportunity to give a plea which he played guilty until August. And then he wasn't suspended until nine months later in October, October 15th 
of that same year. So this might take time, and the Saints could potentially start the season with both Deontay Harris and Marshawn Lattimore, as we discussed in terms of his legal uh, process, at the beginning of the year. They might have both of these guys, for all we know. We don't know yet. But if they have Lil Jordan Humphrey and Marquez Calloway, or excuse me, Marquez Calloway at the, as the X receiver and a Lil Jordan Humphrey as a Z flanker option, as somebody that can get you some yards after catch, and then you can also rotate him into the slot. The big slot is alive and well in New Orleans. Hello. And then you have this opportunity to shuffle in a guy like Deontay Harris as well, potentially Kevin White, if he comes in and has a nice, um, uh, ha- has a really nice third preseason game or, or, or second preseason game, but third preseason game for the team, as I expect that he'll get some extra opportunities on Saturday. The Saints all of a sudden are in a good place, right? Kawan Baker, of course, part of that Ty Montgomery had a sneaky good game as well. So all of a sudden, the Saints are looking pretty all right when it comes to what they have at the wide receiver position. It's not Michael Thomas. It's not Michael Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't let me trip. But I'm just saying there's enough here for the New Orleans Saints to be able to produce. That's the big thing. And especially when you have Sean Payton scheming for you, you have a big six foot four guy that can threaten you after the catch. You have a six foot plus receiver in Marquez Callaway who's not a speed burner, but he'll still beat you downfield and also beat you in the zone and also beat you on a slant. He'll beat you at all three levels. I think that's a pretty, pretty good situation for the New Orleans Saints. We saw all of that in this preseason game up against the Jacksonville Jaguars. And honestly, we saw it against Baltimore as well, but good to see it consistently over the course of these two games as well as during camp. All right, to wrap us up, y'all, we're going to talk defense here in just a second as we continue on with today's episode. We're going to to specifically focus in on the cornerback position. Ken Crawley injured out for a couple of weeks, even though he's expected to be back in week one. Still want to take a look at the secondary and see what you saw with them while Ken Crawley was not on the field and who has the opportunity here to step up in terms of the best coverage player, and why is it Paulson Adebo? We'll talk about that as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. A lot of folks right now talking on Twitter today about the over-under for the New Orleans Saints and their win total set at nine and a half. You think they're going to win more than that? You think they're going to win less than that? Go ahead and check out betonline.ag, a great place for you to go ahead and put down that bet. Fastest and easiest place to do it. Our exclusive betting partners here on Locked On. And of course, if you join right now with a free with a new account, which is also free, you also get a 100% welcome bonus on top of your first deposit. So go and check them out. And there's also a couple of other things you get involved in. We got some contests right now, half million dollar mega contest that's going down, a $200,000 survivor pool that's going down, as well as a big kickoff contest that's underway as well, where you can put a wager down on the September 9th, Thursday night season opener between the Dallas Cowboys and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And if you lose that wager, you can get that wager back up to $25 using the promo code NFL. 100. So really cool stuff as always going down over at Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, family, closing out this episode, take a look over on the defensive side now, specifically focusing in on the cornerback position. And I'm going to talk a little secondary as well, because I thought Marcus Williams had a really, really nice day. Do quickly want to give a shout out to the pass rush though. Uh, Marcus Davenport, 92.2 overall defensive grade on pro football focus, highest graded offense, excuse me, defensive player. Marquez Calloway was the highest graded offensive player, I believe, in the league <laughs> in that second week. And, you know, we discovered why when we talked about him a bit in the last segment. But let's talk about this defense here. I, I, I want to focus in on the cornerback position because we're potentially looking at Paulson Adebo season here. I, I do think that right now, Ken Crawley were to come back if things, all things being equal, right? If nothing changed between now and and when Ken Crawley is healthy ahead of week one, which again, the expectation is that he will be available week one. If nothing were to change between now and then, I think Ken Crawley would walk in and then go right back to his assumed cornerback two position. But there's another preseason game. There are two weeks of practices that are here uh, ahead of that week one game against Green Bay and then a game prep week leading up to the Green Bay game as well. So with that being the case, something could change and it's within Paulson Adebo's grasp to do so. If you watch his game on Monday, you're going to see a big catch that was given up. 18-yard catch with an over route or an out route over the middle of the field that came over to the right sideline. He got completely lost in this one. The receiver did a very good job driving him upfield. He and the safety that were back there kind of met, and it looked like maybe there was an expectation for him to be able to pass the route off to the safety, but the safety broke back out to the outside. And then so when the receiver cut inside, you got about six yards of separation, and I might be overestimating there, but you you got a, 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 a quite a bit of separation there if you watch the film 
from Paul Sandibo. That was a big gain that he gave up. But outside of that, three targets, three catches allowed, 23 yards, zero yards after catch. And this is something that we saw in the first preseason game as well, because he was targeted downfield quite a bit, but isn't giving up yards after catch. He's there for the tackle. He did that on underneath, a couple of underneath routes as well. And he's played extremely well. He's been very physical. He actually ended up taking away during what was the open, kind of that two minute drive that Trevor Lawrence got to lead at the end of the first half before it went back to Taysom Hill. You saw him get in there and uh, get into the red zone, Trevor Lawrence did. And at one point, Paul Sanadibo took away the route that Trevor Lawrence was looking for. He also had two routes that he ended up stifling, one of which that he stifled at the line of scrimmage, which gave him time, and another that he just absolutely locked up in the end zone, forcing Trevor Lawrence to throw it away. And these are the types of plays that you want to see from uh, Paulson Adebo, and you're seeing it, right? You're seeing this physical nature. You're seeing him recognize route concepts. You're seeing him commuting with CJ, communicating with CJ Gardner-Johnson, who we're going to talk about in a second as well, to make sure that everybody is lined up right. This was the football IQ portion of Paulson Adebo that I was so excited about during the draft process because of his knowledge as a former wide receiver and what that means in terms of being able to recognize route combinations. And if this player is lined up here or motions from here to here, this is what the tape says that they're going to do. I know how to defend that because I've done that before. That kind of knowledge is, I was going to say you can't teach that, but you absolutely can teach that because it's knowledge, but you know what I mean? He comes in with sort of an innate expectation and an innate understanding at the cornerback position based on his previous experience as a wide receiver. And I think that is very valuable. There is a chance here that Paul Sinadibo, there's a door that can be opened for him. And maybe it's just cracked open just a little bit. But if he goes and grabs that handle, opens it up and steps through, we could have a little bit of a controversy here in terms of who can be there as the cornerback to opposite Marshall and Lattimore. As we said before, you don't want Paul Sinadibo to be the starting corner opposite Lattimore based on necessity. It has to be because he earned it. Here's an opportunity for him to earn it. Next, I want to talk about CJ Gardner Johnson, CD Deuce. He was just all over the field in this one. He was utilized in a bunch of different ways as well. You saw him line up in the slot 24 times, at corner twice, on the defensive line twice, meaning that he was, you know, rushing from the defensive line. And then you also saw him in the box once. And when we say that he was on the defensive line, it just really means that he was starting on the line of scrimmage. The Saints do that with their safeties all the time. Think back to the San Francisco game. Last year, where CJ Garner Johnson was, that's right, everywhere. You saw that similarly again here against the Jacksonville Jaguars. I think CJ Gardner Johnson is ready for another step up going into 2021. That shouldn't surprise any of you to hear. I've said that before, not just as a player, but also as a leader for the other players around him, helping to usher along some of these young guys. You saw him in on one play get uh, Paulson and Debo set up, you know, where they were doing a lot of motion and moving players from inside to outside, you know, guys that start on the outside, moving into the slot, guys starting in the slot, moving to the outside. And so with all of that, you saw them communicating extremely well. So he's doing a good job relaying information, to these younger guys and helping them understand because CJ Gardner Johnson is somebody that has much like um, Marcus Williams, Marcus Williams, as well as uh, Marshawn Lattimore, when they came into the NFL, who made this immediate impact on the team you're helping one of these younger guys have the opportunity to potentially come in and make an immediate impact himself. So you look at CJ Gardner Johnson, you credit him for being all over the field and doing what he does extremely well, covering in the slot, covering all over the field, rushing the passer, run support, all the things that he does. But you also have to credit him for the mental side and helping to prepare some of these younger players around him for what could be a very important season and an impactful season for them. And finally, I want to wrap up with Marcus Williams. Marcus Williams is in the midst of an opportunity here, right? He's coming into 2021 with an opportunity to get paid ahead of 2022, and he looks like he's ready to get paid. Um, he played, let me look at these, uh, 21 snaps at free safety, right, as a deep safety, three of those in the box as well. Uh, played well in run support, uh, was targeted once, allowed one reception, but only for three yards, immediately crashed down on that, but also had a pass breakup. And this is something that we have to talk about with Marcus Williams. If you watch the tape and you actually get to see what's going on with the safeties, because you don't get to see that in broadcast view, you'll notice that Marcus Williams gets involved in plays that are being, or, or gets involved with passes that are being thrown to areas of the field that he has no business being in. Not to say that he's not supposed to be there, it's just that his range is as such that he's able to get in on those plays. So this is an instance where he was targeted once, he allowed one reception, 
but yet he had one pass breakup because he nearly intercepted a pass that he wasn't in primary coverage on. And that was one of those ones where he almost picked it off. I think it was like at the five yard line. It was it was within the 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 Jags uh, 10 yard line as they were threatening to score a touchdown there. So I just want to point out Marcus Williams and give him a little bit of a shout out here. This was his first action. We didn't see him preseason game one. We saw him here preseason game two. Malcolm Jenkins had some nice moments as well. He allowed one a third down conversion that, you know, you could just see that he got a little bit behind LaVisca Chenault, who has some speed that Malcolm Jenkins just simply doesn't at this point, but still a phenomenal player. And you saw him also get in there and have a pass breakup later on that very same drive. So these safeties are fantastic. The cornerbacks can be fantastic. Ken Crawley also had himself a game. I, I shouldn't go without noticing that or without mentioning that. Uh, he was targeted twice, didn't allow any catches and had a beautiful pass breakup, allowed a 39.6 NFL passer rating when targeted. So he continues to perform, but again, he's injured for the next couple of weeks and the door might be open for Paulson at Debo, but it's exactly this type of performance that says to me that if things don't change from here, Paulson Debo doesn't have a big standout performance. And maybe even if he does, King Crawley should still have those Crawley clamps down on that cornerback two position opposite Marshawn Lattimore. All right, y'all. We've broken it all down, right? We looked at these quarterbacks. We looked at how everything went down. We've talked about Marquez Callaway. We talked about this defense so much that we've been able to break down here over the course of this week. Now, tomorrow, we're going to turn our attention to the Arizona Cardinals. What kind of a game are we going to see? Are we going to see a dress rehearsal? Are we going to see these guys that are toward the bottom of the roster that are fighting for roster positioning and potentially even a roster spot? We're going to talk about who needs to stand out tomorrow. We're going to talk about who are some of those players that we need to keep an eye out on on Saturday's game, on tomorrow's episode. And then, of course, we'll be there right after the game with a recap as well. So, so much, so much going on here on Locked On Saints. And I appreciate y'all very much for being here. We'll be right back with you tomorrow. Now, go and check out Locked On Bets. Win yourselves some money over at betonline.ag. And then come right back here tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Saints. As always, y'all, for everything in between, you can find me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.